Uh, okay, if I have your attention, please. <laughs> We're going to uh, begin Sunday school now. Uh, I want to welcome all of y'all uh, to uh, Sunday school this morning. Uh, it's, uh, this is really a, a not a comfortable situation to be in. Uh, I like teaching, but uh, a little more intimate circumstances in a classroom is much more uh, compatible to my way of doing things. And, and I don't have a, a chalkboard <laughs> or a whiteboard that I can write on, and I like to do that. Uh, I'm about as lost as Carl Rove would be without his whiteboard, I guess, <laughs> um, for those of you who know Carl Rove. Uh, again, welcome to uh, Riverside Baptist Church Sunday School Hour, and uh, we're welcome uh, to join us at any time. Uh, We'll be looking forward to the time when we get back to our regular classrooms and have a little more intimate relationship with our class members. I've missed our class members, haven't been able to see them very often in the past month or so. And we're looking forward to getting back to that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning before we begin our uh, Bible study. Master, thank you again for the day that you've given us. We pray, Father, we'll be good stewards of that gift that you've given us to us to thoroughly use it and to enjoy it. We praise you for that. We ask you, Father, again this morning to uh, allow Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide through the study, the preaching, teaching, the seeing of your word. We pray, Father, this morning <clears throat> that again we'll be faithful servants that we will rightly divide the word of truth in a correct manner. We pray, Father, again this morning that your word as it's preached, taught in every place, that Holy Spirit will be able to deliver it to the hearts of a receptive people. And we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Uh, our lesson this morning is the 13th chapter of Romans. Uh, not an easy thing to teach on. Uh, uh, Brother Jeff and Jim, you're going to get to that chapter <laughs> yourself, preaching through Romans, and uh, know that it's not an easy thing to deal with. It's one of those uh, meaty things of the Word. It's not the kind of thing you get out of a Gerber's baby food bottle. It's not uh, easy to, to digest. It goes against a lot of our nature, and uh, we have to go to the Word of God to find out how we ought to be as that sanctification process takes place in our life that uh, we can apply the instructions of God out of his word to our lives. <clears throat> as we begin, uh, again, look if you can, uh, the 13th chapter of Romans. And it begins, let every person or every soul be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, that first statement is almost like a, uh, an irritant <laughs> to our nature to be subject to governmental or higher authority. The word that's used there is higher authority. So it's not just governmental authorities, but to those things in authority over us. And we have a... Uh, kind of a natural rebellious spirit in the spirit in the first place, and then being told to be subject to governmental authority is kind of uh, rubs us the wrong way to begin with. So, uh, and that statement is it's a declarative declarative statement. It uh, has no qualifications to it. There's no ifs, no buts, no when. It's a kind of because I said so, statement. Uh, I, have you ever said that to your children? You know, because I said so. Uh, how did that go over with them? Uh, how receptive are you when somebody says uh, the reason is because I said so? Uh, we bow up almost uh, as reactive measure. And here Paul comes writing to the Romans and he says, let every person, every soul, be subject to the governmental authority. Um, before we get to 
kind of that statement. Let's kind of reverse it a little bit. And he gives that statement, and then later he gives kind of an explanation. Let's look at the explanation and see how he arrived at that particular statement. And maybe it'll go down a little easier as we ruminate <laughs> on his statement. Maybe it'll go down a little easier. Uh, let's look at um, uh, verse 3 and verse 4. Skip down there uh, first of all. This is sort of the explanation. For rulers are not the cause of fear to good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Um, he begins his reasoning with some things about government that we ought to be clear about. First of all, he makes in these uh, couple of verses, actually and also in verse 4, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it is not, uh, does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. And out of that kind of explanation, I get a few things. One is that he makes a statement that government is the minister of God. And the word minister there is that same word that's used throughout the New Testament, diakonites or diakonos. And it's that word that's used for deacon. It is a servant, sometimes translated. It is a minister uh, of God. This brings us to, really to the, to the point of looking at the sovereignty of God and those under God's sovereign authority. God is sovereign. Blanket statement. Covers everything. He is sovereign, has always been sovereign. He was sovereign from the beginning. The garden was God's sovereign domain. When he put Adam in it, he did not give him a property deed to it. He was to be a minister of God in there. God never gave up his sovereignty, never has, and I suspect never will. He has, in the institutions, delegated authority, not sovereignty. Total, absolute sovereignty is his. He does not give us that authority, that sovereignty. But he has delegated of positions of authority, and he is still God over the family, over the church, and over government. He remains sovereign. These are his delegated servants. That's what Paul refers to here. Here, the minute the government is the ministers of God. Uh, they're in a delegated position. A couple things to remember about a delegated position. First of all, in a delegated position, it is not to be used as an opportunity to defy God. The minister of God is to carry out the mission, the purpose, and the principles of God himself. And they are to be his ministers. And having a position there is not to be used as a method to defy God. Um, it also is not a place for those who are under authority to be able to use that as an excuse for disobedience. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no Flip Wilson clause in this. The devil made me do it, won't float. <laughs> uh, we cannot justify our disobedience and our misbehavior because it is even allowed by a person of authority or a delegated representative in any way. Just because government permits or even legalizes something that is disobedient to the principles of God does not give us excuse for disobe disobeying God's right. sovereign principles. Amen. When God said, thou shalt do no murder, Amen. he meant it. Right. 
And that does not, even though a governmental delegated authority may permit it or legalize it, does not give us an opportunity to disobey the sovereignty of God's principles. Amen. So remembering about delegated authority, they're responsible for being the ministers of God. And as that, they do not have the option or the opportunity to defy God. Neither do we who are under any authority can use that as an excuse for doing the same. Second of all, I see in this uh, passage of scripture that uh, government is there to uphold the moral law of God as his ministers. Uh, we always say, well, come back with this idea, but uh, what if it doesn't? What if the government does not act as a minister of God, carrying out the moral authority and the moral principles of God? God is still sovereign. Amen. <laughs> he doesn't relinquish his sovereignty because we decide to disobey it. Neither we nor those people who are in authority, those people who have that delegated authority, have permission to do this. Uh, notice also that how do you defend yourself in the presence of an authority that seems to be in opposition rather than in subjection to the authority of God? Well, Paul indicates here our first line of defense. How do we defend ourselves? How do we de defend our position? Uh, his first thing here is good behavior is your, first of all, is your best, your first line of defense, yeah. your good behavior. Um, we are all raised in subjection to God under his authority and subject to it, responsible to it. Uh, I have to answer for me, and you have to answer for you when you face God. There's no uh, line in heaven going to be there that I can point to the guy behind me and offer them as an excuse for my responsibility to answer to God. Uh, we'll stand individually and by ourselves when we face that. The good thing is, the good news is, that when God looks at me, he will see covered the sinless blood of Amen. Christ. You know, Amen. that is a defense above all defenses. Amen. First of all, he says, God, uh, good behavior is your defense. Uh, look in, in verse 3, he makes that statement, for leaders are not a cause for fear of good behavior. If you don't want to have a fear of those in authority, just do what's right. Look what he said there. This is just do good. Uh, when that policeman is uh, beside the road and you pass him, your good behavior is your defense. Were you speeding? <laughs> well, you have a defense if your behavior before the law is good. So he said, the first thing you worry about, not having to offer an excuse. Well, I was going to the doctor and I was late. Uh, I was going to pick up my wife. It's her fault. See, we're good at transferring that. I mean, <laughs> Adam did that. It's that woman you gave me, you know. There's no, there's no reason to have to offer some other form of excuse. First of all, offer your good behavior as your defense before the uh, authority. Also in, uh, you know, I looked at in uh, Titus. Titus, if you have your Bible, can turn to Titus. Look at Titus 3.1. Uh, remember, Titus is uh, sent to, I think it's Crete, and there he was to establish a church there and was given some instructions on kind of the how-tos. And in verse chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Paul is instructing Titus, says, remind them, that's the church there, remind them to be subject to the rulers, to authority, to be obedient, and to be ready for every good deed 
every good thing. So let that be your defense. How do you defend yourself before the authority? Well, first of all, that authority is there for your benefit is how it should be viewed first of all. And your good behavior will be the thing that will defend you before authority. Remind them, it's a kind of, you've been instructed once, but remind them that their behavior and before authorities, be <coughs> obedient and be ready for every good gift. Also, I read, read in this uh, passage of scripture in chapter 13 that uh, the purpose of government, the purpose of government is to punish and to reward according to Romans 13. To punish and to, re to reward. It is, to, it is there for the purpose of conducting an orderly society. We have a, a benefit of being a part of an ordered society. Uh, the gospel has a benefit of having an ordered society. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit, there is a, during the time of the New Testament writings here and Paul and Christ himself were in a society that was ordered by order of Rome. It was the empire of their world and it ordered its society. It was not democratic. It was not very uh, bene uh, benevolent in a lot of situations and circumstances. But it did have, there's a term called in history called the Pax Romana, the Pax, the peace of Rome. For a hundred years or more, Rome enforced a peace on the Mediterranean basin. It was during that time that Paul was able to spread the gospel as he's writing here. He was able to travel the empire because it was ordered by Rome and Roman law enforced it. There is a benefit to being a part of an ordered society. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's going to automatically be uh, benevolent it may be harsh but having an ordered society here he says the purpose of government is really to have that ordered society it's to punish and to reward punish those who would do evil and to even reward those who do good uh, we don't get a lot of rewards from government <laughs> uh, a stimulus check every once in a while maybe <laughs> might be considered a, a reward uh, I think maybe it may have been a necessity out of a troubled time that it is actually seeking out to reward somebody for good. But in any case, the purpose of government is to create that ordered society through punishment and reward. Also look in uh, Timothy. Also, uh, look at uh, 1 Timothy 2. Let's see, I think I got that right here. 1 Timothy 2. Uh, 1 Timothy 2. First of all, then I urge you entreaties, prayers, petitions, of, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for the kings of all who are in authority in order that they may lead uh, a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. For it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to uh, come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator, also between God and man, and the man is Christ Jesus. There is a benefit to an ordered society that we can live a quiet and peaceful life. The quiet life is to enable us to spread the gospel. Paul was a beneficiary of that ordered society. He was able to travel farther even than our New Testament even uh, tells us. Uh, there is evidence given that Paul even was able to travel to Spain and even maybe up into Middle Europe. But uh, we don't have scriptural reference to that, but he was able to travel to all kinds of places unfettered because of that ordered society which he was a part of uh, but the order society the kings that have authority 
or, or to enable us to live that quiet life that all men would come to the knowledge of Christ. We are able to spread the gospel in an ordered society more so than one that is in war and in chaos, in revolution uh, and civil disobedience. The purpose of having authority, having a government, is there also look at in chapter 13 back to chapter 13 in Romans and verse 5 wherefore it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath but also for conscience sake that uh, a government is there to punish evil doing wrath externally imposed but also for conscience sake conscience sake is those things that come from us from within those things of conscience that we are, have to ha need to have an ordered, godly, governmental, recognized authority that will enable us to do the work of spreading the gospel. Uh, it will be beneficial. There's also that I don't find in Scripture God has a preferred form of government. Uh, if, there, if there is one, it may be a theocracy. <laughs> uh, that was his original intent, I think, from Scripture, that he would tell the leaders of his people the directions they should go. And they would transmit that to the people. God's sovereignty would be dispensed by that method. Man early defied that. Uh, fact is, Israel, when it <laughs> went through judges and God provided judges appropriate for the situation that Israel found itself in, uh, whether it be uh, uh, Deborah or Samson or whoever, those judges were the person and the authority delegated to them for the situation that prevailed. When Israel decided that it wanted another form of government, it chose, we want a king. That was not God's suggestion. It was Israel's choice. And notice also it says that we want a king like other nations. Now you, you might wonder, you know, did they take a look around and see what kind of kings and kingdoms were around them? Is this really a wise choice? And God even warned them, says, uh, in his permissive will, will permit you to have a king, but I'm warning you, a king will take you to war, they will take your children in conscript to war, and they will tax you, uh, and you will fall victim to the evils, the transgressions, that are inherent almost in a king kingdom relationship of course uh, kings that have existed and do exist have perverted they even even come up well if the authority if i have if i'm a king and i am uh, an authority placed here by god then i must have this because god intended that must mean i have a divine right well if you become a divine right monarch, uh, it leaves uh, temptations to violate the moral principles of God almost wide open. And it did and does. So uh, what kind of government is there is not necessarily one that God designates. It may be more by choice of, of us. Um, it's very good. And I have no problem with having a representative democracy, a republic. I think it is very beneficial and has worked out fairly well and has been able to remedy most of the evils that nations have been subject to, have been prone to. And I am very proud and very uh, appreciative of the government style that we have here rather have that than anything else i can think of uh, but we should leave live that quiet life that all men would be saved notice also in verse 5 how he does in that 
but also for conscience sake, for how you view yourself. In verse 6, for because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God. And he comes back to that same thing again. So he, he starts off early in his explanation and he doesn't leave it. The government, those authorities are the servants of God. Uh, devoting themselves to this very thing. Um, that brings us to kind of the, th the, um, the topic. What kind of citizen should we be if government is here by the direction of God and they are his servants? They have the ability to punish and to reward what kind of citizen should we be? The, the Christian citizen should be the best citizen of the land. The quiet life to spread the gospel ought to be um, kind of the norm. We ought to benefit by a government allowance of the spread of the gospel because they are the servants of God also. A wise government will promote the Christian values and principles and not persecute them. Um, first of all, we ought to be a good citizen uh, because of conscience sake. Yeah. Hmm? It ought to not have to come from us, come upon us externally. It ought to be a matter of our own conscience and our desire. It also is a reflection on our master. That's right. We're under his sovereign authority. How we perform, how we act, how we go about our place as citizens is a reflection on him. Uh, a Christian who sins and is observed in sin. The outside world, the first thing they say is, it's not, he did something bad. They'll come at, their accusation is, that's no way for a Christian to act, right? So what we do, how we become, uh, uh, how we are, is a reflection on the master. Why should we be a good citizen li living the quiet life? Because it's a reflection on our master. Uh, and a wise government <laughs> will promote that type of citizenship and not seek to demean it. It's strange to me that of, of practically all religions that if uh, you speak bad or speak evil, speak demeaning to any other religious group, church, organization, uh, it is almost permissible except for the Christian. Why would even our government seem to single out the Christian church as being a detriment, being a deficiency in our society. A wise government will not do that. You know, people like to mention that um, the principle of the separation of church and state, that's not constitutional. <laughs> in a phrase, it's unconstitutional. It is not in the Constitution of the United States. It was never intended by the framers of the Constitution. Church, the separation of church and state appears one time by Thomas Jefferson writing a letter to a Baptist church in Rhode Island. <laughs> and he was, his advice was that the church and the state in that situation, ought to have, there ought to be a separation. In the First Amendment of the Constitution, where religion is mentioned, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a, a religion nor the free exercise thereof. The restriction is not on the church. The restriction is on the laws of Congress. Congress shall not do anything to inhibit the gospel church. Okay, A wise government will heed that and not stand in the way 
of God's message being spread. Um, verse 6 and 7. We'll move on. That <laughs> maybe a little out of order. Number 6. Chapter six, uh, Verse 6. And because of this, you also pay taxes to rulers as servants of God, devoting themselves to the very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom are told. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Uh, you're to pay your taxes. Uh, tolls, customs, whatever is imposed by the ruling authority. Some person has said that the taxes are the cost of civilization. <laughs> you should pay your taxes as a, the cost of being civilized. When men, people started to live together in cities, that's civilization, city dwelling. Uh, there was a cost to that. When you're running around completely free and wild and uh, living in caves and that kind of stuff, very little uh, need for governing authority. But when we developed a civilization, started living in, in apartment houses, got to have some rules and some enforcement of those rules. Government had to be organized. Taxes are the cost of doing that, and we ought to uh, pay what's cost. Uh, also notice he does end up that with saying, honor to, to whom honor is due, respect to whom respect is due. Uh, I'm reminded that when Paul stood before An uh, Ananias, uh, in fact, if you look, look in chapter, uh, Acts chapter 23, Paul was faced with the same situation at one time. Look at his response. He's been called before the Sanhedrin, and there uh, he's being held in chapter 23. Uh, and uh, Paul, looking intently in the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfect good conscience before God up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him in the mouth. <laughs> Uh, he was evidently offended by Paul defending himself by his good behavior. He says, I behave myself up to this day. And Ananias was uh, rather disturbed by that declaration and ordered somebody to slap him in the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall, and do you uh, sit and try me according to the law and in vindication of the law, order me uh, and violate victim." Uh, violation of the law order me to be uh, to be attacked but the bystander said do you revile God's high priest and Paul said I was not aware brethren that he was the high priest for it is written you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people uh, honor to whom honor respect to whom respect he evidently did not know who actually told somebody to smack him in the mouth and it was the high priest. And when he found out it was the high priest, he offered it basically an apology. I didn't know you were hit with, that was the high priest who said that. And he says, uh, it's kind of like I apologize for uh, backbiting <laughs> at a, a person who is an authority. Uh, he may have been right, but he was said, it's still not right for me to uh, point out his deficiency. Uh, in verse 8, it, some people say this is kind of a turn, but it really is all in the same keeping. If I get close at time, somebody's going to have to come up here and shut this off or tell me to go away. <laughs> uh, in verse 8, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Um, owe no man anything. No, owe no man nothing. Uh, Sometimes that is used as a uh, condemnation of debt and credit card living and that kind of thing. Uh, and in a sense, it does. But there are other, I think, even better scriptural uh, accounts of why we ought to be debt free, ought not to live in a, a position of being in, in debt. Uh, this may not be the best, but it's still a good one. I'm not sure, it, because he's referring to something in the middle of another topic, 
that this is the best represent. But in any case, just it is uh, there is a benefit to being debt free, living without debt. That ought to be, from my point of view, scripturally, I think scripture teaches that we ought to be debt free, except for one debt. We are indebted to love. Why should we be financially debt free? <laughs> it, well, it does feel good. Yeah, it's nice to be uh, not have. No matter what thing you can do right, you still feel good. Yeah, okay, you can feel good about that. But also, you know, we pray and expect and uh, enjoy God's blessings to us. And prosperity is, uh, if you're going to get it, it's going to come from God. But what if you're in debt? If you're in debt and you pray for God to prosper you, you have to give away God's blessings. If you're in debt, you have to give it away. Uh, it was Elijah or Elisha, the widow who came to him uh, with uh, her, her son were starving to death and in debt and he blessed them and gave them the vial that had the oil that never went dry. His admonition to them, for her first was, Go, pay your debt, and you and your son live off of the rest. She was in debt. The blessing God gave through the prophet had to be given away to the usury <laughs> before she could live in the prosperity of God. So if you're in debt and remain in debt and go farther in debt, and God does des desire to bless you, the first thing you're going to need to do is to give away God's blessing. What a terrible thing to pass up, <laughs> to have to give away what God blesses us with. So, uh, except for the debt of love. Notice that he says in this that, uh, that uh, let me see, owe nothing except to love one another for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Read on. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not uh, murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And there is, uh, and if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in the phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Notice how, to, how the contrast that he puts here, that the law and love, that love is the, and he uses the word fulfillment, fulfill the satisfaction of the law. Obedience satisfies the law. Thou shalt not steal. Don't steal. You've satisfied the law. But beyond the law and the legal, the conscience uh, realm, living in the conscience, not just the fear of punishment, but living as one who has a conscience toward the recognition of a sovereign God, love fills to fullness, fulfill, fills to fullness what the law said in the first place. Want to go beyond the law? Love your neighbor as yourself. What did Jesus say when he was uh, confronted with what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. That is the fulfillment of the law. Uh, now, back to verse 1 and 2. <laughs> Here's all that reasoning stuff. Now, how does he come to this conclusion where he can say that every person be subject to the governing authority for there is no authority except from God, God's sovereignty, and those who exist are established by God, by God's per, uh, permissive will. 
Therefore he resists authority, therefore he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who are opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Why should we be subject to governing authority? He just gave you all the reasons why and came to this, this conclusion that we all need to be subject to the authority of God. Uh, Obedience satisfies the law. Love will fulfill it. Uh, verse 11. We're going to move on here. Uh, this is a by the way. After stating this, this Paul basically says, and by the way, look what it says. And this do knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. And now... Salvation is nearer to us uh, than it was when we were believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Like, by the way, hey, one of the reasons we should be a subject authority, a reason why we should uh, place ourselves in authority, why we should be good citizens, live the quiet and peaceful life. The reason why is this. Time is short. I, that is such a great phrase. It is nearer always than it was when we were saved. So what we think is, hey, the advent of God into human affairs through Christ Jesus and our gathering that great salvation, the time of the redeeming of us <laughs> to the kingdom of God, you know, to that governing authority is nearer now than it was when we were saved. It is always going to be nearer yeah. now than when we were saved. And the looking forward to that, to that great time when God does put everything in his order, by the way. And notice how he says on, we're to put on Christ. How should we be viewed? By putting on Christ. Uh, <clears throat> I come back to that question, but what if government, the authority, is defying God? Well, we have remedy for that. We have answer for that in that we are subject to God's authority ourselves just, just as they are. And how should we be viewed by putting on Christ? I used the phrase before, we, God's going to see us through the blood covered by the sinless blood of Christ. That's how he's going to see us. How should government see us? As a citizen of the kingdom Amen. of God, not just a subject under the citizenship and authority of the, of the country in which we live. Uh, one more time. The, what if the government itself practices evil? Uh, how did Christ... Did you just say, what, what that how, how are we to be when we view government as practicing evil? should we expect our government to treat us any better than it treated Christ what did Christ say it says don't told us not to expect any better treatment than they gave him if they'll treat the son of God by murdering him illegally Should we expect any better? He warned us that we won't be treated any better, but we're still to suffer. If we do right, and even if the governing authority does wrong. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Master and God, we thank you, Father, for your word. Uh, prayerfully, we request that the uh, Holy Spirit has been able to work in us to be able to rightly divide that word, to correctly interpret it, to correctly apply it. We pray that 
even ourselves, knowing that we are individually responsible and answerable to you first. And that as long as we can, in good conscience, know that we are found a good and faithful servant, that is enough. We pray these things now in your Son's name to his glory. Amen. 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 Good work.